tell you heroes out there, I'm your professional protagonist, and welcome back to Let's Make a Fighting Game, the show where we build our own fighting game from the ground up. In the previous videos, we covered our basic game concept, our game mechanics, and in the last one, we began covering the individual characters of the game, beginning with our main protagonist and our main villain. Today we'll be continuing that deep dive and looking at all of our backstories and personalities and abilities. But before that, we have to call out our subscriber of the day. So let's all give a big hell yeah to Nub New Big Boy Beats. <laughs> If you want to be subscriber of the day, then all you need to do is be two things, subscribed and leave comments down below on any of these videos or community posts. Just be sure that your subscription settings are set to public and not private. That way, YouTube will give me this handy little red dot right here to let me know that you are subscribed. With the shout out out of the way, let's return to the main focus of today's video, the characters. At the end of each of these character videos, you, the audience, get to vote to see which characters you want to be focused in the next episode, which means that the results of today are from your vote, and at the end of this one, you'll be able to vote to see who's gonna be showing up in the next one as well. So stay tuned until the end so you can make sure that your voice is heard. And for now, let's jump straight into the character that received the most votes from last time. Rusty Barnes. We all have a past. Ghosts. They're the shadows that define our every sunny day. Sherlock Holmes. Rusty Barnes came about when I was tinkering with the uh, typical ar archetype of the grizzled old veteran with grit in his teeth and regret in his past. The idea came to me that if someone were to be haunted by the ghosts of their past, wouldn't it be cool to have them manifest as actual ghosts and set them upon the opponent? A unique reversal, where instead of being dragged down by his demons, he uses them to instead drag you down. After that, I knew exactly when and where he had to come from. Westerns are well known for their grit and gumption, and the American Old West was a transition period that for many holds a certain majesty, an almost mystical allure. But it was also an uncertain time that led to rampant devastation, large-scale greed, and of course, a certain word that's unsafe to say on YouTube, but begins with the word G and rhymes with schmenicide. So it was decided. This fighter would be a cowboy from the American Old West who manifests his regrets and the sins of his past into ghostly apparitions to aid him in his brawls. Now, it's at this point that I do have a confession. Fully designing and fleshing out 20 unique characters, ensuring they all feel unique, all different in how they operate, is actually really hard to do all by yourself. Especially when you're making them back to back. It's really draining and difficult not to wind up following the same patterns over time and retread old ground that you've already covered. So, for some of these characters, after I created the initial concept, I handed them to certain friends and associates to expand upon and flesh them out some more. I gave them the freedom to work with that as much as they wanted under the stipulation that whatever they returned to me, I would still be able to alter, change, add, remove in any way that I saw fit until it fit the vision that I had for the character. So I have to give many thanks to my good roleplay buddy Lugubrious for his stellar work on Rusty Barnes, who took my initial concept and provided back a product that I ended up actually altering very little. Now let's tell the story of the storyteller. Rusty Barnes was born on October 31st, 1848 in the great state of Kentucky. At this time, the American public was no stranger to manifest destiny. 
This being the year that the Oregon Territory was founded, and the year that birthed the California Gold Rush. But there was still a large stretch of land between the east and the west that had yet to be fully explored. And what would eventually become the entirety of the southwestern United States had just been ceded as part of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, marking the end of the American-Mexican War. True, the people were colonizing fast, but there was still plenty of land to grab, trails to blaze, and places to chart. A young Rusty Barnes went out into those untamed lands with his friends, a group of fledgling cowboys that learned what it meant to truly be alive. Enraptured by the majesty of nature, Rusty knew that no other life could be for him, and his friends stood by his side through it all. It was as though he embodied the spirit of the age itself, for there was no terrain too harsh, no conditions too foul, no location too remote to throw him off. With every trail he blazed, the new world got a little smaller and a little smaller. But of course, exploring the Old West wasn't exactly the safest occupation, even for those who were trained and prepared for it. Just as this new world was shrinking down, so too was his posse, through various casualties. A rock slide, a flood, Wild animals, even a chance encounter with some of the natives spelled the end for some of his friends. Rusty didn't regret it. They died doing what they loved, and he'd be happy to do the same. But he still had to live with what happened next. No age lasts forever. As American colonizers pushed ever westward, the wild frontier driven back further and further as more land settled into civilized territories and states. The average person meant no harm, of course, but people on such a large scale are naturally destructive, and with them brought a voracious greed that ravaged the landscape and resources, and drove people to harm their fellow man, especially the natives. Rusty looked upon all this and couldn't understand it even coming to regret having blazed all those trails for his peers. This wasn't what his friends had died for. This old cowboy refused to adapt to a new era, one which had no use for visionaries like him. And so he fought. His rebellion didn't last long and was naturally doomed to failure as he was branded an outlaw, a bandit, and subdued by the law. The next several years were the most miserable of his life, locked away in jail with naught but his own company, just himself and his old memories. They were far brighter and more vivid than the drab and dreary present he found himself in. So he'd repeat them to himself and to any others who'd listen, earning the nickname The Storyteller. He even decided to bind his eyes to blind himself, so that he would only be guided by the shining light of the past. Eventually, that guidance came. He wasn't sure if it was something he manifested himself, or if he was going crazy, or if it was old friends emerging from beyond the grave. But he found that guidance all the same. Spirits that spoke to him through his memories, taking familiar forms. A black stallion. A slithering rattlesnake, a blue bird, and the setting sun itself. They allowed him to see what he couldn't see, and guided him once he had served his prison time. Now a free man, he continued to long for the glory days, spiting what had become of society, and earning a humble living off the dollar of those who'd stand by and listen to him tell his tales. Then one day, a man appeared before him claiming to be the god of time and showed him a terrible future. A future where there was no frontier. When all the land had been stripped of its magic. A time ruled by an unchecked, rampant population. Rife with greed, with no stories left to tell of the natural world. Only more growth. His rage burned once more, 
and he accepted the challenge, the opportunity to stop this terrible future. No nebulous contest would hold him back from righting the mistakes of the past and creating a world of ceaseless wonder and unspoiled beauty, whose songs would never die and remain unclaimed wilderness for all time. The New Frontier. Now that we've seen where the storyteller comes from, let's take a look at how exactly he intends to bring about the New Frontier. In terms of fighting style, he's very much a brawler, someone untrained in formal martial arts, but with enough experience to scrap with the best of them. He's not afraid to make use of his surroundings to gain an advantage, so you can expect to see a lot of broken bottles, pocket sand to blind the opponents, his lasso for some ranged command grabs, and of course, good old fashioned fisticuffs. Gameplay-wise, he'd work well as an all-rounder, someone who's pretty balanced in terms of speed, damage output, and health, with options for close, mid, and long-range combat. His combos would have a lot of mix-ups owing to his pragmatic nature, with a lot of different types of attacks branching off of other ones, to keep your opponent guessing if you're going to be going high, low, or somewhere in the middle. Rusty's flexibility is called Reverie, and it's a stance mechanic. When you press the flux button, he'll take a position where he's thinking, holding his hat, and recalling the past. In his Reverie stance, you can follow up by inputting a command for one of his special attacks, and that leads to him loading his gun with a special bullet, a spirit bullet. Activating the flux again will have him fire that spirit bullet with a different effect depending on which special attack input was used. And this ability is known as Blast from the Past. Each of the four specials will lead to a different Blast from the Past attack, and if that bullet strikes an opponent, then the corresponding special attack that was used to generate it will receive an upgrade. Each of his specials can be upgraded twice for three levels in total. That means that, technically, Rusty has 12 special attacks. The past will blow you away. Which means we move right along to his special moves. The first one is called Broken Bronco, a simple forward charging hook punch that closes in a small bit of distance. At level two, it becomes Bucking Bronco and becomes a Rekka allowing you to mix up and follow up the attack with different inputs. The three follow-ups are an overhead punch, a strong straight punch, or a ducking low punch. At level three, it becomes Boundless Bronco, adding an additional effect to each of the three follow-ups. The overhead will cause pop-up, the straight will wall bounce the opponent, and the low punch will cause a hard knockdown. When using this special, the ethereal spirit of a black stallion appears behind Rusty, matching movements with him based on the follow-up attack chosen. Its blast from the past fires out a fast, mid-position projectile shaped like a galloping Mustang. Uh, that's the, uh, the horse and not the car, for those of you keeping track at home. Saddle up, hombre. Storyteller's second special attack is called Dust Crawler, which sends him sweeping across the ground in a low sweep, kicking up dust as he goes. It deals little damage, but it sends him a fair bit farther than the Bronco and has a shorter recovery period. At level two, it becomes Dust Biter, covering a longer distance and moving a bit faster. At level three, it becomes Dust Devil, which, sorry to disappoint you, has nothing to do with vacuums. But it does turn the move into a multi-hitting attack. When used, the spirit of a snake slithers alongside Rusty, biting the opponent for each hit that the attack makes on them. Its blast from the past is a low projectile shaped like a slithering snake. Tread on this. His third special move is an attack called Sundowner, and it's a counter, wherein Rusty pulls up his poncho, and if hit in this animation, throws off the opponent by whirling it in their face, following it up with an underhanded pistol whip. At level two, it becomes the Sunlighter, with the added effect of increased damage and knockback. At level three, it becomes Sunriser, and turns that knockback into knock up 
sending the opponent into the air for some follow-up air combos. When used, the spirit of an orange sunset appears behind both of them, darkening the characters in a visual straight out of a classic western. Its blast from the past is a short-range shotgun burst of sunlight. This is where your sun sets. Which brings us to the fourth and final special move, Buzzard's Dare. It's an anti-air with some super armor on the upper half of Rusty's body, in which he holds his hat down with one hand while punching up with the other. Level 2 is Raptor's Dare, which adds an energy spiritual projectile out from his fist to cover a bit more range. Its final form is Eagle's Dare, increasing the size and wingspan of the spirit energy to cover a wider, larger area. When used, the spirit of a sky blue bird unfurls its wings and flies up from within him, and its blast from the past is a quick upward angled projectile in the shape of a hawk. Don't even try it! Whew. With his flux ability tying directly into his special moves, that was a lot to lay out. But we've covered them all! And that means it's time to take a look at Rusty's super moves! In keeping with his penchant for having options at all distances, his level 1 super would initiate as a mid-range grab attack using his lasso, tossing it out at mid-height to ensnare his opponent. With successful contact, this leads to him yanking the opponent towards him while winding up for a big punch, then climaxes by slamming his fist into their face, horseshoe-covered knuckles and all complete with a big close-up to <clears throat> emphasize the impact. The impact will send them flying back to the far end of the screen, thus ending the move. This is called the Cattle Driver. Time for a roundup. Rusty's level two super is called Gold Rush. His spurs begin to spin so fast that they glow red hot and sparks fly up. He then gives a big wide-angled kick from low to high, hitting any opponents up close to him with multi-hitting attacks. The sparks fly a short distance as well and cause some damage if the main attack misses, but they won't interrupt any opponent with a flinch, meaning that if they're able to avoid the main big kick, they can still punish you. Feel my passion. Lastly, we have Rusty's level 3 super. It begins with him rapidly loading all four spirit bullets into his revolver and firing them off quickly, fanning the hammer. The first spirit to emerge is the snake, going low to the ground as usual. If the opponent manages to dodge or otherwise avoid the snake, then the other three spirits will fire from his gun per their usual blast from the past rules, albeit straightforward instead of at their usual angles. And if any of them hit the opponent, then they will upgrade their corresponding special move as per normal Blast from the Past rules. However, if the snake does make contact with the opponent, then you'll be treated to a cinematic special in which the snake binds and constricts the opponent, restraining them, only for them to look up in horror as the Black Stallion kicks them up into the air. Helpless, the bird knocks them down straight back to good old terra firma right next to Rusty. The moment that they impact the ground, they explode for massive damage as the sun sets behind our two combatants, darkening their silhouettes all while twangy western music plays. This devastating combo is the soul of the west. My regrets won't spoil <laughs> the new frontier. And that covers everything for Rusty Barnes the Storyteller. With his all-around options, he'd be great for anybody to pick up and play, but to become a master of those options would require much time and dedication. Much like the nature that he respects, he's adaptable to any situation, but you'll need to tailor your approach for each opponent. Now we leave Rusty Barnes behind in order to focus on the second character of this episode. Your votes take us from one fighter who might have some supernatural influence to one who is an 
unabashedly supernatural. While one seeks to restore life, the other gave up on life for an unending death. Let's trade in pistols and lassos for blood and fangs as we deep dive into the gothic realm of Amis. From blood and pain comes perfection. American Horror Story. Friends, I'll be real with you. Not every one of these characters was developed by tinkering with ideas that I thought would be especially interesting or opposed to one another, nor were developed by a deep thought process. Some, like this one, are as basic as you can get, but there's good reason for that. Some ideas just have universal appeal, a strong staying power in the cultural zeitgeist. So when I opened up the can of worms that is this game, with its limitless potential for character types, how could I, a fan of gothic horror, not include the most famous monster of all? If you know me, then you know that my favorite monster is the vampire. Well, actually, my favorite monster of all time is the Wendigo, and that has been getting a good amount of publicity and media over the last several years. But that particular creature would be a little bit difficult to adapt to this style of game, while also maintaining respect for the Native American cultures that it comes from. So, vampire it is! Of course, that still left quite a lot to be determined, considering that the vampire is quite possibly the single most versatile monster archetype out there. Would I stick to the original myths as closely as possible and make this creature an immortal witch who lives on the blood of others, who has no such weaknesses to exposure of sunlight, and doesn't die from a stake through the heart? The original purpose for the stake was to nail them down in their place of rest so they couldn't rise until they starved. Would I go the more comedic route, wherein having cast aside their humanity so long ago has made them socially stupid and inept? Similar to what we do in the shadows. I say Mr. Sinatra, forgive me my mind's a little foggy, but last time I looked, you weren't Chinese. Ring-a-ding-ding. -ding. I stand corrected. Should they be tortured by their inner beast, cursing what they have become? Perhaps I could go the route of the drug allegory. Or do I go as crazy and over the top as possible, to the point that the very thought of standing against them is <laughs> The only thing I knew for certain that this character would never be is Jared Leto. Sorry everyone, I'm afraid that this is not, in fact, Morbin time to really date this video. Ultimately, I think that Fans of Castlevania will be very pleased with the direction that I go with this. Because at the end of the day, I could not deny the appeal of the ever-classic gothic vampire lord. With that determined, I recruited the aid of my good buddy Justin James Conadaris to help flesh it out a bit more. And now, I present to you Amis, the Countess of Red. Born many centuries ago, in a small, remote European village, the young girl who would eventually become Amis led an unremarkable and uneventful life. She worked hard to provide for her family and her lord, only to suffer the same fate as most women of the era. She was sold off as a bride to a complete stranger. The strange man, adorned in the vestments of a priest, simply appeared one night declaring that he had fallen in love with her from afar, and gave her father a bag of gold then and there to seal the deal. While the prospect of being sold into marriage was not a pleasant one, it did give her some comfort at least to see the level of wealth that this man possessed, to know that she would at least be living in comfort. 
Discovering just how uncomfortable things were about to be was only the first of many surprises to come. Her new husband did not come from wealth at all. He had no manner, no coin, not even a carriage or horse to take her with him. Using some unnatural strength, he carried the woman deep into the woods to a remote ramshackle cabin to be their new home together. He explained a great many things that night that shattered her world. He was no man, and certainly no priest. He was a vampire. He had recently fled his own vampire sire, a lord residing in the nearby hills, and taken a bag of his gold with him, which he had used to buy her hand. This vampire had chafed under the command of his sire, and so he sought his own power to build his own lordship, beginning with her. Thus, he drained her body of life and gave her the gift of unlife in its stead. The next several years went by as her sire taught her control of her new powers, how to manage her thirst, when to give in to it when necessary, while attempting to build his new empire. However, this vampire was not the most effective. His strategies were rather short-sighted, his tactics greatly inefficient, just as when he had used a whole bag of gold for her hand in marriage, rather than investing into the creation of his new empire. They were not entirely devoid of progress, as he had sired more spawn, and they had increased to a larger layer. But it became clear that, immortal or not, a loser with all the time in the world is still a loser. Resentful, she rallied the other vampires around her and put into action a plan to debase the local vampire lord directly. And she succeeded. Her sire entered the church halls that once had belonged to his own sire, giving out praises to her for a job well done for taking such great initiative. But she did not seize power for him. The would-be lord was locked within the church by his own dark children as it was set ablaze. Then they turned on the rest of the town, and this former peasant woman became her home's personal apocalypse. Once the flames had died out, she found her sire still barely clinging to life amidst the ashes, and finished him. Then she saw, as his blood soaked into the amis he always wore, it was then that she made her decree. She would forever now be known as Amis, the Countess of Red. Amis and her small contingent of followers traveled across Europe for many years after this, building her fortune and power through guile. Over the next century, she had a manor built in an isolated area of what would become Germany, a place of true horrors, filled with deadly traps at every turn, and hidden cells for her cattle. Occasionally, some hunters would enter, but none were ever successful. The most interesting guest she ever had to entertain was when another vampire discovered her and decided he needed Amis as his concubine. She refused, of course, and for his insolence, manipulated a local group of hunters into killing him for her, ending two annoyances at once as the group thought that they had taken care of the local threat. Yes, that was a fun time. And so, this is how life continued for Amis. Once in a while, she would vanish from her manor for a century or so at a time, building her connections across all of Europe, but she would always return home eventually. That is, until on one such trip, she came face to face with a stranger who showed her a vision of a terrible future, one in which all of her kind had been wiped out, all her work for naught. The hunters had won, but that could change if she participated in a contest. Furious, Amis doubled down 
and swore that not only would she survive, she would turn all of Europe into her personal domain. But of course, to create that empire and defend it, Amis needs the power to back it up, which means it's time to get into her fighting style. Despite vampires almost always being depicted as being supernaturally durable, Amis would have the smallest health pool of any fighter in the game, being the squishiest one, for game mechanic reasons that will become clearer as we go on. She would have above average speed, but not so much that she'd be a hyper-aggressive rushdown style character. No, Amis would, like Rusty before her, actually be heavily reliant on mix-ups. Being able to chain different types of attacks and combos together to keep the opponent guessing. This draws on her centuries-long experience in combat, various vampire blood magic abilities, and learning several different kinds of fighting styles. All in all, she's a solid fusion between a mix-up fighter, a stage-controlling zoner, and a hit-and-run fighter. She wants to limit the opponent's options, get in, do some damage, and get back out before they can counterattack. And of course, her moves would be dripping in vampire flavoring. I'm visualizing her dodge roll as a unique animation where she turns into bats, licking her fingers after certain combos to taste her opponent's blood. There's a lot of personality that we can inject into her animations. Speaking of flavoring, that leads us into her flux. Blade of Sanguine. Activating it will form a blade of blood around her arm for a few seconds, giving her extended reach while it lasts. Additionally, this flux will allow her to deal normal damage to an opponent who is blocking instead of chip damage, though it won't send them into a flinching animation and interrupt them, even if they aren't blocking, as though the opponent now has super armor. But the big kahuna of effects here is that it will refill her own health bar as it drains the opponents. Naturally, all of these effects stem from draining the blood out of her opponent. Now it's time to take a look at Amisa's special attacks. The first harkens back to one of the most ancient and still most widely used vampire abilities, the hypnotic gaze. Amis will strike a pose and look directly at the opponent, sending hypnotic waves out in a straight path. If it strikes an opponent who isn't blocking, as blocking will count as shielding the eyes, it won't deal any damage. But it will put them into a stunned state for a second, allowing for Amis to punish them. This is called Countess Beckoning. You can't resist me. Next, we have Shadow Walk, which combines the old vampire myths of being able to melt into and move through the shadows, as well as moving at preternatural speeds. Amis will melt into the floor as a shadow, only to vanish entirely, then reappear behind the opponent in an instant. As she reappears, she'll strike the opponent with an attack that depends on what follow-up input you've put in. A low thrust that causes tripping. A high backstrike that impales the opponent, then knocks them back. Or an upward anti-air swing. I am the knight. Third, we have an ability revolving around shape-shifting. Amis' upper torso will transform into a giant wolf's head, stretching out at an upward angle, turning any opponent caught in the area into a chew toy. This special also counts as a command grab, and will fling the opponent in whatever direction you press, and serves as the most damaging of her specials. The Beast Within. Amisa's fourth and final special harkens back to the vampire trope of being able to control and manipulate the lesser of undeads. Blood dictation. Amis drips a bit of her blood into the ground below her, which soaks in and vanishes, leaving the spot unmarked with no further effects 
until your opponent steps on the spot. Once they do, oh boy, they've got to deal with a landmine situation. An undead creature erupts from the earth to deal some pain from beyond the grave. What kind of undead and what effects it has depends on how many drops Amis uses. You can only have one instance of Blood Dictation active at a time, with each time you use the special upgrading the creature that lies below. Each use also moves the trapped spot to wherever she last used the ability. With one drop, a skeleton reaches out from the ground to grab the opponent, slowing down their movement until shaken off. At two drops, a zombie will grab them, slowing down their movement but also dealing a small bit of damage over time as it bites them. With three drops, it becomes a banshee, knocking the opponent up in an explosive force as it wails. And the highest level of blood dictation, at four drops, will release a Draco Lich, a powerful undead dragon, to burst forth and fly up! Having the same effect as the Banshee, but over a much wider area. Serve your mistress. With these four special moves, you can see how Amis aims to take control of the battle, both of her opponent and the space around them, to press her advantage. Just like the manipulating allure of the vampire, she'll manipulate the battlefield to pick the best opportunity to strike fast, then fade away into the shadows for safety. In contrast, her super moves will be all about unleashing her full, monstrous power. Her level 1 super acts as a mid-range trap in which she gestures with one hand to form a pool of shadowy tendrils that linger for a second or two. If an opponent is caught by the tendrils, they'll be enveloped within it like a dark iron maiden. While Amis completes this comparison, by forming a dozen or so blood blades, which impale the shadow prison from all sides with telekinetic movement. The shadows then unravel, the blades disappear, and the opponent is left on the ground. This positively medieval super move is called Umbran Climax, as a fun little reference to the Bayonetta franchise. I sentence you to death. Amis' second super with two bars of meter sees her transform into a swarm of bats that dart across the stage. If the opponent is touched in this state, the bats swarm all around them, biting and clawing at them, getting in several hits of damage before Amis forms back from the swarm behind them. Fangs sank deep into their neck. It ends with a powerful forward kick that knocks them back and out of her grip, while she licks her lips. Like all damage that's dealt with her flux, this one also increases her life bar, and is called Banquet Invite. You are cordially invited. Attendance is mandatory. Her third and final super move is called Army of Red, and it really pushes the T-rating vibe that I'm going for with this. The move begins with a simple uppercut. Should it land, the move transitions into a full cinematic, showing the opponent knocked up into the air as darkness envelops them from all sides, looking as though night has fallen. All manner of ghosts, spooks, bats, and whatnot fly all around them before the Draco Lich from her fully empowered Countess Dictation move swoops in down to slam them into the earth. There, an army of ghouls, zombies, and other manner of undead drag them up onto an executioner's platform under a guillotine. Below waits Amis goblet in hand. As she snaps her fingers, we cut to black, followed by the sound of slicing and the opponent taking massive damage. 
The cinematic ends as the black shrinks down, forming into Amis in the center of the stage, the opponent on the ground some distance away. Blood and circuses for everyone. And so ends the move set on what is, unquestionably, the darkest character in this entire roster. Now, don't get it twisted. While everything that I just described sounds like it would fit right in with Mortal Kombat, actually, it might be a little bit tame for Mortal Kombat standards. I still intend on this matching a T for teens rating. I imagine this game looking a lot like Street Fighter or King of Fighters, if any of the artwork that I've commissioned is any indicator. It all comes down to presentation. After all, if Super Smash Bros. can have Simon and Richter Belmont from Castlevania, an incredibly bloody and mature series, performing the Grand Cross on Mario and Kirby, then I think we can have Amis pulling off a French Revolution on other characters off-screen. With the right presentation and style. But that'll do it for this Character Spotlight episode! Whew! Four down, sixteen to go! That's a lot. So stick around for the next one, and be sure to leave your votes in the comments for the two characters that you would like to see spotlighted in the next character episode, as we continue to build Quantum Combat! Have a fantastic day, everyone, and let's give Storyteller and the Countess of Red a great, big, HELL YEAH!